All right. So last time we talked about power series and their radius of and the radius of convergence for different power series. And in particular, we had to take functions and find the representation of those functions as power series. So today we're going to talk about basically uh, a special kind of power series called a Taylor series. And then there's a special case of the Taylor series that we call a Maclaurin series. But to get to that, I want to pose a question. If we have uh, some power series given by the function f of x right here, can I determine what the coefficients are? Meaning, can I say what is c1, what is c2, you know, c0, all of these? Well, let's look at this. If we write this out, f of x is going to be equal to, so this sum is written c0 plus c1 times x minus a plus c2 times x minus a squared. Remember, a is where we're centering this power series plus c3 x minus a cubed plus c4 x minus a to the fourth and so on, right? Well, notice if we plug in x equals a, right? So if x is equal to a, then what we get is this part will become zero, this becomes zero, this becomes zero, this becomes zero, right? Because we have that x minus a. And so what we're left with is this c sub zero is going to be equal to f of a, right? And so I've created a formula for f of a. Now, let's see if we could do this for c sub 1. Well, for c sub 1, what I would do is look at f prime of x. So we can look at this two different ways. We could either write um, the power series, write the new summation using our derivative rules from last section. Or I've, I could just look at the f of x above and see, okay, what's going to happen when I take a derivative? Well, c0 is a constant, so that's going to go away. If I multiplied uh, c1 times x minus a out, we'd get c1x minus c1a. So notice this is a constant. It'll go away when we take a derivative. And the derivative of c1x will just leave, a, leave us with c1. So in particular, the derivative of c1 times x minus a is just c1. And then the derivative of this next part right here, this will give me c uh, 2 times c2 times x minus a plus 3 times c3 x minus a squared plus 4 c4 x minus a cubed and so on. And so again, if I take x to be equal to a, then all of these parts are going to become 0 except for this first part where we have c1. And so what we get is that c1 is equal to f prime of a. So maybe we're on to something, right? If I'm looking at this pattern, c0 is f of a, c1 is f prime of a, maybe c2 is f double prime of a. Who knows? Let's look. Okay. Well, the second derivative would give me, so the c1 is going to go away. Now the derivative of 2c2 times x minus a, so we'd have 2c2x minus 2c2a. This is a constant, so it goes away. The derivative of 2 times c2 times x, well, 2c2 is a constant, so the constant times x, when we take a derivative of that, we just get the constant back. So then the derivative of 2c2 times x minus a will just be 2c2. And then we'll have 6c3 x minus a plus 12c4 x minus a plus, so what would have been over here is we would have had a 5c5 x minus a to the fourth. So the derivative of that will give us 20c5 x minus a to the third. Okay. Oh, and I'm forgetting a squared right here. There we go. 
and then so on. Okay, so now if I plug in, again, x equals a, because this gets a lot of stuff to just disappear. Right, this goes away, this goes away, this goes away, the rest of it goes away. And what we would be left with is that 2c2 is equal to f double prime of a, which means that c2 is equal to f double prime of a over 2. All right, so our, our uh, assumption was wrong, but now I'm going to do one more and see if maybe we can notice a pattern. So the third derivative, right, f triple prime of x, this would give us 6c3 plus 24c4 x minus a plus 60c5 x minus a squared plus, so uh, let's see, in here we would have had a Give me one second. So we should have had that was five. So we'd have six times five times four. I'll give us one twenty. Yes. So we should have after taking the derivative of what's there, we should have one hundred and twenty times. Uh, let's see. We should have c sub six x minus a cubed. Okay. and then so on. And so then this tells me if x is equal to a, then we'll have 6c3 is equal to f triple prime of a, which means that c3 is equal to f triple prime of a divided by 6. Notice where these numbers are coming from. Right, we have to multiply this exponent, uh, right, so here, this would have started out, we would have had a fourth power, right, so we would have had to do four times three times two times one to get to 24, and so it's coming from four factorial. And if I notice, this six is three factorial, this is two factorial, there's technically a one factorial down here, and there's a magic little zero factorial right here. Okay, so I'm going to write this as two factorial, and write this as three factorial. And so now I can see that c sub n, sorry, our result, is that if you pick some number i, then c sub i will be equal to the ith derivative of f evaluated at a divided by i factorial. Right, so if I want to know what c sub 7 is, I would take the seventh derivative of f of x evaluated at a and then divide by 7 factorial, and that'll give me c sub 7. And this is what leads to what we call Taylor series. So a Taylor series is we just replace that coefficient, right, that's our c sub n, with the formula that we just came up with, and then multiply by x minus a to the n. So a Taylor series is our power series where we're writing the c sub n as this nth derivative evaluated at a divided by n factorial. A Maclaurin series is just a Taylor series when a is zero. So when you take a Taylor series um, about x equals zero, then we call it a Maclaurin series. So let's look at example one. Example one asks us to find the Taylor series for f centered at a equals five if the nth derivative evaluated at 5 is given by this formula. Okay, well, we know that the Taylor series formula is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 
the nth derivative evaluated at 5 divided by n factorial times, since we're centering, centering at a equals 5, right, that's how I know that that 5 is there, and then that's why I know that this is x minus 5 to the n. And so now I'm going to plug in our uh, nth derivative evaluated at 5 formula. So this becomes the sum from n equals 0 to infinity. Uh, well, let's see, our n factorials would cancel out, and so we'd have negative 2 to the n over 7 to the n times n plus 5 times x minus 5 to the n. Okay, and then to get uh, the radius of convergence, I'm going to leave a lot of practice exercises in here for y'all for some of them. Uh, if I think maybe it's a little difficult, then I'll tell you what test to use. Um, but this will be a good chance for you to go pack back and practice finding the radius of convergence. So here, I would suggest doing the ratio test. And you should get that r is equal to 7 halves. Okay. And so I'll mark that this is a practice problem. Okay. Now, um, example two, we are asked to find the 31st derivative of f and to evaluate it at 5 if f of x is given by this formula. Well, what I want to notice real quick is that this formula is a little special, right? This formula actually looks like a Taylor series. Right, if I call this our C sub n, um, so let's call that C sub n, then this is a Taylor series centered at x equals 5. Sorry, at a equals 5. And like we said, C sub n is going to be equal to 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 2 factorial. Well now we know in a Taylor series that c sub n, right, so this is our c sub n, is supposed to be equal to the nth derivative, since we're centering it at 5, so this should be equal to the nth derivative evaluated at 5, divided by n factorial. And so if I multiply that n factorial across, then I'll get 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 2 times n plus 1 is equal to fn of 5. And so now I've gotten a formula for the nth derivative evaluated at 5. So if I want the 31st derivative evaluated at 5, all I have to do is plug in n equals 31. So this becomes 2 to the 32 over 33 times 32. And we'll leave it at this. Um, but with just a little bit of algebra, we can actually determine that this is going to be equal to a number. Now let's look at example 3. Example 3 asks me to find the Taylor series for f of x equals e to the 2x centered at a equals negative 1. Okay, so let's remember what our formula is. So we're going to want to write that e to the 2x is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of the nth derivative of, let's see, our a is going to be negative 1 over n factorial times x minus a, so this will be x plus 1 to the nth power. So whenever I see this, the issue with this is that I need to figure out what is the nth derivative of this f of x evaluated at negative 1. So I'm just going to start trying to figure out the formula for the nth derivative of this function. So let's see, f of x is equal to e to the 2x 
f prime of x would be 2 e to the 2x. f double prime of x would be 2 times 2 x times e to the 2x. I put an equal sign in there, that might help. f triple prime of x, the third derivative, is going to be equal to 2 times 2 times 2 times e to the 2x. So I think we can see a pattern now. So it looks like the nth derivative of x is going to be 2 to the n times e to the 2x. And notice this still works even when n is equal to 0, right? So this case n is equal to 0, and it still works. So then fn of negative 1, well, I'll just take our formula, and I'm going to plug in negative 1 for x. So then this becomes the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 2 to the n over e squared times n factorial times x plus 1 to the n. And that will be our Taylor series formula for f of x equals e to the 2x. Now let's try to find the Taylor series for f of x equals 1 over x centered at a equals 7. So again, we know that 1 over x is going to be equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity. nth derivative evaluated at a equals 7 divided by n factorial times x minus 7 to the n. And so again my first step is to figure out what is the nth derivative of this function. Well another way to write 1 over x is x to the negative 1. So I can write f of x is equal to x to the negative 1. f prime of x is equal to negative 1 times x to the negative 2. f double prime of x is equal to negative 1 times negative 2 times x to the negative 3. f triple prime of x would be equal to negative 1 times negative 2 times negative 3 times x to the negative 4. And so hopefully we can see a pattern going on here. Right. What I want to notice is that this is positive, this would be negative, this would be positive, this would be negative. And so what this tells me is that this is going to be alternating between positive and negative. So the first thing I know that I need in my nth derivative of x formula is either a negative 1 to the n or a negative 1 to the n plus 1. And so what I'll do is I'll look at, say, the third derivative. Well, if this is negative 1 to the n, negative 1, or sorry, this is a second derivative. This is negative 1 to the n, then this would be negative 1 squared, which would give me a positive number, which is what I want. So I do want this to be negative 1 to the n, and not to the n plus 1. Okay, so now that would get rid of our negative signs. The next thing I notice is that there should be an n factorial. And then after that, I notice that if you take, say like this for example, this is the third derivative. If we multiply 3 by negative 1 and then subtract 1 from it, that'll give us this negative 4. Okay, so then this is x to the negative n minus 1. Alrighty, another way to say that is that this is over x to the n plus 1. Kind of just write it whatever way works better for you. Okay, so now we need to find fn of 7. So this will give me negative 1 to the n times n factorial over 7 to the n plus 1. Okay. So then plugging into our formula over here, we should have the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of, let's see, we'll have 
The n factorials will cancel out. We'll be left with negative 1 to the n over 7 to the n plus 1 times x minus 7 to the n. Okay. And uh, notice that I haven't marked down the radius of convergence of this one or the last one, but it's still something um, that you might want to go ahead and double check. Right. So for this one, I would recommend using the ratio test. And when using the ratio test, you should get a radius of convergence of r equals 7. Right. So again, another practice problem. Okay, so let's move on to example 5. Try to scoot this back over. All right, for example 5, we're asked to again find a Taylor series. So again, I'll start with writing ln of x is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of the nth derivative evaluated, let's see, we're centering at 2, so this should be evaluated at 2, over n factorial times x minus the center, so x minus 2 to the n. Okay, so now, let's see, we have f of x is equal to ln of x f prime x is equal to 1 over x, which is the same thing as x to the negative 1. f double prime of x is negative 1 x to the negative 2. f triple prime x is negative 1 times negative 2 times x to the negative 3. The fourth derivative would give us negative 1 times negative 2 times negative 3 times x to the negative fourth. On and on and on. So now what I want to notice is that there's a pattern here except for the very first one, which means that we can come up with a formula so long as n is greater than or equal to 0, right? Because this is the zeroth derivative. Okay, so when we're not following that formula, I notice, okay, well, we're definitely alternating signs, so there's got to be a negative 1 to some power. Well, the first derivative is supposed to be positive, so I'm going to make this a negative 1 to the n plus 1. Then we have a factorial, but notice this is 1 times 2 times 3 but this is the fourth derivative. So this is going to be n minus one factorial, and then it should be divided by x to the n. So then that tells me if we're centering this at two, that when n is greater than or equal to zero, the nth derivative evaluated at two is going to be equal to negative one to the n plus one, n minus one factorial, over 2 to the n. So, oh, and I did this in a completely wrong color, so let me go ahead and make sure that this is kind of broken off. All right. That's kind of where we started. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that ln of x is equal to, so I'm going to break this sum up since we have this issue with our nth derivative. So if I pull out the zeroth derivative, right? So this will be f0 of 2 over 0 factorial times x minus 2 to the 0. And then we'll take care of the rest of the sum after that. So then we'll have n equals 1 to infinity. So now since I'm going from 1 to infinity, we can follow our formula that we got for the nth derivative which is that fn of 2, well, let's see, we'll have a negative 1 to the n plus 1. The n minus 1 factorial over n factorial will leave me an n on the bottom, times 2 to the n. And then this should be times x minus 2 to the n. And so notice that this is really just going to be, so the zeroth derivative that's sitting right here, 
So the zeroth derivative evaluated at two would be ln of two. Zero factorial is one. The way you remember that factorial is kind of like the different uh, number of ways that we can uh, rearrange a set of objects, right? So if I just have one object, there's only one way I can rearrange or one way I, one way I can arrange that set of object. Now, if there's two objects, you know, we could start, say we have a red and a blue one. We could have the red one on the left, the blue one on the right, and then swap them. That gives me two ways. However, if I have zero objects, there's still, there's one way to represent zero objects. It's, you don't do anything with it because you can't. So that's why we say zero factorial is equal to one. Uh, so this is ln of two. Well, x minus two to the zero, anything to the zero is gonna be one. So this is gonna be ln of two plus the sum from n equals one to infinity. And this can all stay the same. We've simplified this as much as we can. Okay, so that's how we handle something whenever it doesn't follow um, a pattern the entire time for our nth derivative. Now let's move on. So I'd like to recall that the Maclaurin series is literally just a Taylor series where a is equal to zero. So that's why you see fn of zero right here and this right here, that's technically x minus zero to the n, but x minus zero is just x, so we just write x to the n. All right, now we've been dealing with Maclaurin series in sections 11.8 and 11.9, since it's just a power series centered at a equals zero, where we're writing out the formula for c sub n. Um, so in particular, we were asked to find a power series representation for one over one minus three x. And we found that f of x was equal to this. And so we can say that this is a Maclaurin series because it's a Taylor series centered at zero. Okay, now let's look at example six. We're asked to find the Maclaurin series for f of x equals e to the x. So what we have is that e to the x should be equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. Okay, so sorry, this should be nth derivative of zero over n factorial times x to the n, right? So this is literally just our Taylor series formula where we're plugging in a equals zero. So now the step that I was skipping, f of x is equal to e to the x, f prime of x is equal to e to the x, so on, we always know that the nth derivative uh, of x is going to be equal to e to the x. So if I evaluate this at zero, then I get e to the zero, which is one. So now I can say that this is one over n factorial. So this is the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. And this is going to have an associated radi radius of convergence of infinity. Okay, now let's look at example seven. Example seven asks us for a little bit more difficult Maclaurin series. But the trick is that, you know, if we're interested in cosine, we're probably inter interested in the sine function as well. Well, it turns out once we get the Maclaurin series for cosine, it's pretty easy to get the one for sine. We just have to struggle through getting the one for cosine. So we know we're gonna want to write cosine of x equals the sum from n equals zero to infinity of the nth derivative evaluated at zero over n factorial times x to the n. Okay, 
And so this is the tricky part is figuring out the nth derivative evaluated at zero. Well, we know that f of x is equal to cosine of x. So f prime of x will be negative sine of x. f double prime must be negative cosine of x. Third derivative must be positive sine of x. Fourth derivative will get us back to cosine of x, and so on. So what I want to mark down is that this is the zeroth derivative, first derivative, second derivative, third, fourth, and so on. We're going to kind of split these apart. Now, when I evaluate each of these at zero, cosine of zero is one, negative sine of zero is zero, negative cosine of zero is negative one, sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one. So we can see the pattern that's going on here, right? So now, let me write out what that would look like. So using this sum formula, so I'd have the nth derivative evaluated at, so we'd start with the zeroth derivative evaluated at zero, which we know is one. So this would be one over zero factorial, which is one times x to the zero, which is one, right? So I just evaluated this sum by plugging in zero. Now, if I plug in n equals one, well, I'll be looking at the, uh, the first derivative evaluated at zero. So we'll get zero over n factorial plus x to the n. So that's just going to be zero. Now, if I look at plugging in n equals two, I'm going to have the second derivative of f evaluated at zero, which we know is negative one. So this is going to be negative one over two factorial times x squared. Then we'll have to do the third derivative, so we'll get another zero. And then for the fourth derivative, we'll have one over four factorial times x to the n. Okay, so we can really say this is one over zero factorial x to the zero. I'm gonna take out the zeros, right? So this is plus negative one over two factorial x squared plus one over four factorial x to the n, and so on. First thing I notice is that there we are alternating signs in here, okay? So I know that there must be a negative one to the n plus one or a negative one to the n. So I'll look at say the third term in this series. This is gonna be positive so I want this to be a negative one to the n plus one. Sorry, I take this back. If we're starting at n equals zero, then this would be the first, second, uh, sorry, zeroth, first, second term. Right, we have to keep in mind the fact that we do start at n equals zero. Okay. So this is going to be negative one. I want this to be positive, so it should just be to the n times, now we've got this fraction going on, right? Uh, so I've taken care of the alternating signs up top. So let me leave this on top of my fraction. And then on bottom, we've got zero factorial, two factorial, four factorial. I notice we're adding two every time. Another way of saying that is we're doing 2n factorial on bottom, right? Because this was from n equals 1, so that'd give us our 2. This is at n equals 2, so that'd give us our 4, and then so on. Oh, and this should have been x to the 4th. My apologies. And so then this should also be times x to the 2n. And so then this right here is going to give us our Taylor, or sorry, our McLaurin series for cosine of 2x. 
And this will also have an associated radius of convergence of infinity. Now, what's nice about this is that sine of x, the difference here is which terms are going to be zero and which ones are going to be positive. So notice if we could kind of like integrate, right? If I could integrate each of these then we would have gone up a step from cosine up to positive sine, right? And so when we do the Maclaurin series for sine of x, we would have just started basically one step higher. Well, remember, when I integrate, so we can really say that sine of x is equal to the integral of cosine of x, which is equal to the integral of the sum from n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n over two n factorial times x to the two n. Should probably throw some dx's in here. And so this tells us that sine of x is going to be equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity Remember, we have to add one to our exponent of x, so this becomes 2n plus one. Then we'll have divided by 2n plus one factorial. Right, because what happens is that we have a 2n factorial down here, and then we multiply that with 2n plus one. Yikes, that's a weird two. All right, so we multiply that with 2n plus 1. That's what gives us that 2n plus 1 factorial on bottom. Okay. And we know that the radius of convergence will be preserved. So r equals infinity. Now let's look at example 9. Example 9 is a neat trick of, well, we already know the Maclaurin series for e to the x. Right, we know that this was equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, right? We did that earlier. So this tells us that e to the x squared, well, now I just need to plug in uh, x squared for x. So we'll have n equals zero to infinity of x squared to the n over n factorial. And so this is the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the two n over n factorial. Now let's look at example 10. Example 10 asks me for the integral of x times cosine of x over two uh, using series. Okay, so if I'm being forced to use series here, then what I'm going to do is note that cosine of x is equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n times x to the two n over two n factorial so this means that cosine of x over two must be equal to, so now I need to plug in x over two for x inside our series. All right, now that I've done that, we can rewrite this as let's see we'll have negative one to the n on top we'll still have an x to the two n and then on bottom we'll have two to the two n times two n factorial okay so that gives me cosine of x over two now if i want to get x times cosine x over two so i'll multiply this by x and that means that I'll need to multiply this series by x, 
which will give me the sum from n equals zero to infinity. Now I just need to add one to my exponent of x. Right, so a lot of times when you're asked to find these more difficult integrals or series or stuff, it's kind of easy to start with, okay, what's my base parent function here? Right, and so we identify this cosine right here. So we start with our cosine, which gives us cosine of x over two. Then we can multiply by x to get this x cosine of x over two in terms of its uh, power series. Now, now once we're here, so we're actually going to start integrating this. So the integral of x cosine x over two would be the integral of this series. DX. And so what I do here is we will add one to the exponent of X. So this becomes X to the two N plus two and then divide by that new exponent. So we'll have two to the two N times two N factorial times 2n plus 2. And that will give me the integral of x cosine of x over 2 in terms of its uh, power series. Oh, and I'm missing one thing. Let me squeeze this in here. Hopefully someone's like screaming it out at home. Plus c. Now I'm done. Okay, now let's look at example 11. This will kind of be like, I guess, one of our last long examples for this section, and then the next two after this should go pretty quickly. So here it's good for us to notice that sine of x is equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n times x to the two n plus one divided by 2n plus 1 factorial, which means that sine of 4x squared, so now I just need to plug in 4x squared for the x. So we'll have, this is going to be equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity, negative one to the n, 4x squared to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. So this will give me negative 1 to the n. Let's see, we'll have 4 to the 2n plus 1 times x to the 4n plus 2, because I have to multiply the 2 and the 2n plus 1 divided by 2n plus 1 factorial. So then the integral of this, so the integral of sine of 4x squared dx will be equal to, so now I'm just going to take this series, we will add 1 to the x value, or sorry, the exponent of x, 4 to the 2n plus 1, and we'll have x to the 4n plus 3 over, so we should have 2n plus 1 factorial times our new exponent for x, so times 4n plus 3. Alrighty, now let's look at example 12. In example 12, what I see here is I'm seeing a negative one to the n divided by two n plus one factorial. This is a key time to note, right? So you're going to need to have your cosine of x, sine of x, e to the x, uh, ln of x, these more basic uh, Maclaurin series, we should have memorized, okay? Because when I see this, I need to automatically think sine of x. 
right? There's got to be something going on with sine of x right here. The next thing I'm going to notice is that this part that I'm circling in blue, these have the same exponent. So this is really just pi over 3 to the 2n plus 1, right? Which is going to tell me, so I can rewrite this as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity. Let's see, we'll have negative 1 to the n pi over 3 to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. And so this is going to be equal to sine of pi over 3. Right? If I go back and look at this, if I took pi over 3 and plugged it in for x right here, then I would have exactly what I have down here. Okay? So that's why I'm saying, you know, you see um, this negative 1 to the n over 2n plus 1 factorial basically just being multiplied with something else. It's, it's being multiplied with this pi over 3 to the 2n plus 1. So that negative 1 to the n over 2n plus 1 factorial tells me that this is going to be sine. And then the inner part uh, that has the exponent to the 2n plus 1, that tells me what's going to be inside this sine function. Okay. Similarly here on example 13, I notice that this negative 1 to the n over n factorial, this should automate, automatically make me think e to the x. Right? And then this other part, this 2 to the n times x to the 3n, well that's equal to 2x cubed to the n. And so then this is going to be, so let's see, this is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n times 2x cubed to the n over n factorial. And so this is going to be e to the, since we have this negative 1 to the n, this is going to be e to the negative 2x cubed. Okay, so I hope this was helpful um, and glad you've gotten through to this point. I hope you have a great rest of the week and a great weekend. Please don't hesitate, hesitate to reach out for help over any of this material.